In Barcelona, there is a popular accusation made against Real Madrid. Los Blancos, according to most in Catalonia, are the football club that represent the establishment, the team associated with centralism and conservatism. They were viewed for decades as Franco's team. Francisco Franco Baimonde, more commonly known as General Franco, ruled Spain from 1939 until his death in 1975. His dictatorship, which began after his troops stormed Barcelona and brought the three-year-long Spanish civil war to an end, was marked by the brutal repression of any opposition. Franco led with open totalitarianism, making decisions exclusively on his terms. Those outside the capital were marginalised and resentment, particularly in Barcelona and the Basque country, festered. Inevitably, this deep political divide found its way into football. Barcelona's players, coaches and supporters claimed throughout Franco's dictatorship that Madrid were unfairly advantaged and used as a political tool by the regime. In Madrid, this was dismissed as nothing more than a myth, as a conspiracy conjured by Barcelona to discount Real's success through the 50s and 60s. But those of a Barcelona persuasion were adamant that Franco had a significant part to play in the rise of one of Europe's most dominant teams. When Barcelona faced Madrid, it is, according to many culas, the nation against the state, freedom fighters against General Franco's fascists. The Spanish civil wars are vanquished against its victors. A confrontation represented by the assassination of Barcelona's president at the start of the war, wrote Sid Lowe in his book Fear and Loathing in La Liga. But as Lowe points out in his history of the rivalry, to label Madrid Franco's team is an oversimplification. The politics were complex, and some of the accusations based on little more than rumour. One story tells of Real Madrid's signing of the great Alfredo Di Stefano in 1953. Barcelona had been interested in the Argentine and looked almost certain to bring him to Catalonia from Colombian club Millonarios. That was until his previous club, River Plate, claimed a breach of regulations in the transfer. Di Stefano even played for the Blaugrana in a friendly, but the move was scuppered, and he instead joined Madrid, with Barcelona renouncing their rights to the player. He would of course go on to win five European Cups in a row with Real Madrid, changing their status in the game forever. The claim ever since, inevitably, has been that Franco's influence over the clubs involved led to the breakup of the transfer and allowed Madrid to swoop in. Now, there is little doubt that Franco used Los Blancos as a way of improving his and Spain's image during the reign. He regularly attended games throughout the 50s and 60s, watching on as Di Stefano inspired his side. Their president, Santiago Bernabeu, had been installed by Franco immediately after the Civil War. Some viewed him as a puppet of the regime, and further suspicions were raised when he banned a major Francoist from attending games. The insinuation was that nobody without close links to Franco would have been able to get away with that. And Bernabeu had been given the go-ahead to build a cavernous new stadium too, which generated the funds to put together such a talented squad. But Franco's unashamed support of Madrid led to calls of favouritism. Salvador Sadoni, Barcelona's goalkeeper during the 60s and 70s, claimed Madrid were almost impossible to beat because they were Franco's team. The accusation was that one of Europe's best sides were great only because of the despotic leader with the power to influence things behind the scenes. This was likely exaggerated, although Franco certainly latched on to the football team that best suited the ideology he intended to promote, that of centralism and of Castilian traditions. His image behind what was for many years the best football team in the world was what most concerned the dictator. The club's virile technique was meant to reflect the qualities of the diminutive dictator's own regime, wrote Giles Tremlett in his book Ghosts of Spain. In fact, it was probably Franco who used Real Madrid rather than the other way around. It is, however, still the favourite club of the political right. And the association is one that Madrid have looked to distance themselves from in the years since Franco's death. Barcelona, of course, have drawn attention to it, and it adds fuel to an already raging fire and gives even more of an edge to each Clasico. Barcelona fans still point to the two-legged cup tie between the clubs in 1943, early in Franco's regime. The Blagrana won the first leg 3-0, but were then supposedly paid a visit by one of Franco's henchmen. He told Barcelona players that only the generosity of the regime allowed them to play in the first place. It was a subtle hint, and the return leg ended in an 11-1 victory for Madrid. 
That result, given the scoreline in the first leg, seems unlikely to have come about without any outside influence. Again, the legitimacy of the story is unclear, and those involved on both sides offered different answers to the same question. Barcelona's suspicions are understandable. Franco did not hide the fact that he effectively used Madrid's players as diplomats in his attempts to build political bridges in Europe. Nor did he hide his disdain for Catalan and Basque culture. He wanted a united Spain, one that spoke the same language and accepted the same ruler. Athletic Club were forced to change their name to Atletico Bilbao, and Barcelona became Barcelona Club de Football. Football became a small but effective tool in Franco's arsenal. Now, there is no real proof and no tangible evidence that suggests Madrid were exclusively Franco's team. But Spain's leader did undoubtedly use football for political leverage. Real Madrid's history, their rivalry with Barcelona, the shape of modern Spanish football. Without Franco, all of this would look very different.